morning, friends. Among our many lost values, there is one more, the high worth of those people who spoke and wrote Russian before us. It is odd that they are almost undescribed in our pre-revolutionary literature. Only very rarely do we feel their breath. From Marina Saveta Yeva, or Mother Maria, in her recollections of Bloch, they saw too much to settle on any one thing. They reached toward the sublime too fervently to stand firmly on the earth. Before societies fall, just such a stratum of wise, thinking people emerges, people who are that and nothing more, and how they are laughed at, how they were mocked, as though they stuck in the craw of people whose deeds and actions were single-minded and narrow-minded, but the only nickname they were christened with was Rot. Because these people were a flower that bloomed too soon and breathed too delicate of fragrance, and so they were mowed down. These people were particularly helpless in their personal lives. They could neither bend with the wind, nor pretend, nor get by. Every word declared an opinion, a passion, a protest. And it was just such people the mowing machine cut down, just such people the chaff cutter shredded. They had passed through these very same cells, but the cell walls, for the wallpaper had long since been stripped off, and they had been plastered, whitewashed, and painted more than once, gave off nothing of the past. On the contrary, the walls now tried to listen to us with hidden microphones. Nowhere is anything written down or reported of the former inhabitants of these cells, of the conversations held in them, of the thoughts with which earlier inmates went forth to be shot or t to imprisonment in the Solev Solovetsky Islands, and now such a volume, which would be worth forty freight car loads of our literature, will in all probability never be written. Those still alive recount to us all sorts of trivial details, that, were used to be, that there used to be wooden trestle beds here and that the mattresses were stuffed with straw. That way back in 1920, before they put muzzles over the windows, the panes were whitewashed up to the top. By 1923, muzzles had been installed, although we unanimous, unanimously ascribed them to Beria. They said that back in the 20s, prison authorities had been very lenient toward prisoners communicating with each other by knocking on the walls. This was a carryover from the stupid, tr stupid tradition in the Tsarist prisons that if the prisoners were deprived of, deprived of knocking, they would have no way to occupy their time. And another thing, back in the 20s, all the jailers were Latvians from the Latvian Red Army units and others, and the food was all handed out by strapping Latvian women. All this was trivial detail, but it was certainly food for thought. I myself had needed very badly to get into the main... Soviet political prison, and I was grateful that I had been sent here. I thought about Bukharin a great deal, and I wanted to picture the whole thing as it had actually been. However, I had the impression that we were by now merely the remnants, and that, it, and that in this respect we might just as well have been in any provincial internal prison. Still, there was a good deal of status in being here, and there was no reason to be bored with my companions in my new cell. They were people to listen to, and people with whom to compare notes. The old fellow with the lively eyebrows, and at, six thirty, and at sixty-three, he in no way bore himself like an old man, was Anatoly Ilik Pestenko. He was a big asset to our Lubyanka cell, both of us, both as a keeper of the old Russian prison traditions and as a living history of Rus Russian revolutions. Thanks to all that he remembered, he somehow managed to put in perspective everything that had taken place in the past, and everything that was taking place in the present. Such people are valuable not only in a cell. We badly need them in our society as a whole. Right there in our cell we read Pastenko's name in a book about the 1905 revolution. He had been a social democrat for such a long, long time that in the end it seemed he had ceased to be one. He had been sentenced to his first prison term in 1904 while still a young man, but he had been freed outright under the manifesto proclaimed in October 17, 1905. The story about that amnesty was interesting. In those years, of course, there was no, there were no muzzles on the prison windows, and from the cells of the Belaya Terzov prison, in which Vestenko was being held, the prisoners could easily observe the prison courtyard and the street, and all arrivals and departures, and they could shout back and forth as they pleased to ordinary citizens outside. During the day of October 17th, these outsiders, have, having learned of the amnesty by telegraph, announced the news to the prisoners. 
In their happiness, the political prisoners went wild with joy. They smashed window panes, broke down doors, and demanded that the prison warden release them immediately. And were any of them kicked right in the snout with jack boots, or in punishment cells, or was anyone deprived of library and commissary privileges? Of course not. In his distress, the warden ran from cell to cell and implored them, Gentlemen, I beg of you, please be reasonable. I don't have the authority to release you on the basis of a telegraphed report. I must have direct orders from my superiors in Kiev. Please, I beg of you. You will have to spend the night here. And in actual fact, they were most barbarously kept there for one more day. On getting back their freedom, Vestenko and his comrades immediately rushed to join the revolution. In 1906, he was sentenced to eight years at hard labor which meant four years in irons and four in exile. He served the first four years in Sevastopol, central prison, where, incidentally, during his stay, a mass escape was organized from outside by a coalition of, a, a coalition of revolutionary parties, the SRs, the anarchists, and the social democrats. A bomb blew a hole in the prison wall big enough for a horse and rider to go through, and two dozen prisoners, not everyone who, want, not everyone who wanted to escape, not everyone who wanted to escape, but those who had been chosen ahead of time by their parties and right inside the prison had been equipped with pistols by the jailers, fled through the hole and escaped. All but one, Anatoly Fastenko, was selected by the Russian Social Democratic Party not to escape, but to cause a disturbance in order to distract the attention of the guards. On the other hand, when he reached exile in the Yenisei area, he did not stay there long, preparing his stories, and later those of others who had survived. The well-known fact that under the Tsar our revolutionaries escaped from exile by the hundreds and hundreds, and more and more of them went abroad. One comes to the conclusion that the only prisoners who did not escape from Tsarist exile were the lazy ones, <laughs> because it was so easy. Vesenko escaped, which is to say, he simply left his place of exile without a passport. He went to Vladivostok, Vladivostok expecting to get aboard a steamer through an acquaintance there. Somehow it did not work out. So then, still without a passport, he calmly crossed the whole of Mother Russia on a train and went to the Ukraine, where he had been a member of the Bolshevik underground and where he had first been arrested. There he was given a false passport and he left to cross the Austrian border. That particular step was so routine and Festenko felt himself so safe from pursuit that he was guilty of an astonishing piece of carelessness. Having arrived at the border, and having turned in his passport to the official there, he suddenly discovered he could not remember his new name. What was he to do? There were forty passengers altogether, and the official had already begun to call off their names. Vestenko thought up a solution. He pretended to be asleep. He listened as the passports were handed back to their owners, and he noted that the name Makarov was called several times without anyone responding. But even at this point, he was not absolutely certain it was his name. Finally, the dragon of the imperial regime bent down to the underground revolutionary and politely tapped him on the shoulder. Mr. Makarov, Mr. Makarov, please, here's your passport. Vestenko headed for Paris. There he got to know Lenin and Lunacharsky and carried out some administrative duties at the party school of Longjumeau. At the same time, he studied French, looking around him, and decided that he wanted to travel farther and see the world. Before the war, he went to Canada where he worked for a while, and he spent some time in the United States as well. He was astonished by the free and easy, yet solidly established life in these countries, and he concluded that they would never have a proletarian revolution, and even that they, even that they hardly needed one. Then in Russia, the long-awaited revolution came sooner than it expected, and everyone went back to Russia, and then there was one more revolution. Vestenko no longer felt his former passion for these revolutions, but he returned, compelled by the same need that urges birds to, to their annual migrations. There was much about Vastenko that I could not yet understand. In my eyes, perhaps the main thing about him, and the most surprising, was that he had known Lenin personally. Yet he was quite cool in recalling this. Such was my attitude at the time, that when someone in the cell called Vastenko by his patronymic alone, by his patronymic alone, without using his given name, in other words, simply Illich, asking, Illich, is it your turn to take out the latrine bucket? I was utterly outraged and offended because it seemed sacrilege to me only to use Lenin's patronymic in the same sentence as latrine bucket. But even to call anyone on earth Illich, except that one man, Lenin. Illich? Illich. For, for this reason, no doubt, there was much about Vastenko 
for this reason no doubt there was much that festenko would have liked to explain to me that he still could not bring himself to none the less he did say to me in the clearest russian thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image but i felt i failed to understand him observing my enthusiasm he more than once said to me insistently you're a mathematician it's a mistake for you to forget that maxim of, Des of descartes question everything question everything what did this mean everything certainly not everything it seemed to me that i had questioned enough things as it was <laughs> and that was enough of that or he said hardly any of the old hard labor hard labor hard labor political prisoners of czarist times are left i am one of the last all the hard labor politicals have been destroyed and they even dissolved our society in the thirties why i asked so we would not get together and discuss things and although these simple words spoken in a calm tone should have been shouted to the heavens should have shattered window panes i understood them only as indicating one more of stalin's evil deeds it was a troublesome fact but without roots one thing is absolutely definite not everything that enters our ears penetrates our consciousness anything too far out of tune with our attitude is lost either in the ears themselves or somewhere beyond but it is lost and even though i clearly remember festinko's many stories i recall his opinions but vaguely he gave me the names of various books which he strongly advised me to read whenever i got back to freedom in view of his age and his health he evidently did not count on getting out of prison alive and he got some satisfaction from hoping that i would some day understand his ideas i couldn't write down the list of books he suggested and even as it was there and even as it was there was a great deal of prison life for me to remember but i at least remembered those titles which were closest to my taste then untimely thoughts by gorky whom i regarded very highly at that time since he had after all outdone all other classical russian writers in being proletarian and plekhanov's a year in the motherland today when i read what plekhanov wrote in october twenty eighth nineteen seventeen i can clearly reconstruct what festenko himself thought i am disappointed by the events of the last days not because i do not desire the triumph of the working class in russia but precisely because i pray for it with all the strength of my soul we must remember engel's remark that there could be no greater historical tragedy of the working class than to seize political power when it is not ready for it such a seize of power would compel it to retreat far back from the positions which were won in february and march of the present year when festinko returned to russia pressure was put on him out of respect for his old underground exploits to accept the, an important position but he did not want to instead he accepted a modest post in the newspaper pravda and then a still more modest one and eventually he moved over to the moscow city planning office where he worked in an inconspicuous job i was surprised why had he chosen such a cul-de-sac he explained in terms i found incomprehensible you can't teach an old dog to live on a chain realizing that there was nothing he could accomplish vestenko quite simply wanted in a very human way to stay alive he had already gotten used to living in a very small pen on a very small pension not one of the personal pensions especially assigned by the government because to have accepted that sort of thing would have called attention to his close ties to many who had been shot and he might have managed to survive in this way until nineteen fifty three but to his misfortune they arrested another tenant in his apartment a debauched perpetually drunken writer l s blank who had bragged somewhere while he was drunk about owning a pistol owning a pistol meant an, ob an obligatory conviction for terrorism and festenko with his ancient social democratic past was naturally the very picture of a terrorist therefore the interrogator immediately proceeded to nail him for terrorism and simultaneously of course for service in the french and canadian intelligence services and thus for service in the czarist okrana as well and in nineteen forty five to earn his fat pay the fat interrogator was quite seriously leafing through the archives of the czarist provincial gendarmerie administrations and composing entirely serious interrogation depositions about conspiratorial nicknames passwords and secret rendezvous and meetings in nineteen zero three nineteen o three in the tenth day which was as soon as was permitted his old wife they had no children delivered to anatoly Ilyich such parcels as she could manage to put together a piece of black bread weighing about ten and a half ounces after all it had been brought in the, bought in the open market where bread cost fifty roubles a pound and a dozen peeled boiled potatoes which had been pierced by an awl when the parcel was being inspected and
being inspected, and the sight of those wretched, those truly sacred parcels tore at one's heartstrings. That was what this human being had earned for sixty-three years of honesty and doubts. The four cots in our cell left an aisle in the middle where the table stood, but several days after my arrival they put a fifth person in with us and inserted a cot crosswise. They brought in the newcomer an hour before rising time, that brief, sweetly cerebral last hour, and three of us did not lift our heads. Only Krabarenko jumped up to sponge some tobacco and maybe with it some material for the interrogator. They began to converse in a whisper, and we tried not to listen. But it was quite impossible not to overhear the newcomer's whisper. It was so loud, so disquieting, so tense, and so close to a sob, that we realized it was no ordinary grief that had entered our cell. The newcomer was asking whether many were shot. Nonetheless, without turning my head, I called, I called them down, asking them to talk more quietly. When on the signal to rise, we all instantly jumped up, lying abed, earned you the punishment cell. We saw a general, no less. True, he wasn't wearing any insignia of rank, not even tabs nor could one see where his insignia had been torn off, torn off or unscrewed, but his expensive tunic, his soft overcoat, indeed his entire figure and face, told us that he was unquestionably a general, in fact a typical general, and most certainly a full, and most certainly a full general, and not one of your run-of-the-mill major generals. He was short, stocky, very broad of shoulder and body, and notably fat in the face. But this fat, which had been acquired by eating well, endowed him not with an appearance of good-natured accessibility, but with an air of weighty importance, of affiliation with the highest ranks. The crowning part of his face was, to be sure, not the upper portion, but the lower, which resembled a bulldog's jaw. It was there that his energy was concentrated, along with his will and authoritativeness, which were what had enabled him to attain such rank by early middle age. We introduced ourselves, and it turned out, out that L.V. blank was even younger than he appeared. He would be 36 that year, if they don't shoot me. Even more surprisingly, it developed that he was not a general at all, not even a colonel, not even a military man, but an engineer. An engineer. I had grown up among engineers, and I could remember the engineers of the 20s very well indeed. Their open, shining intellects, their free and gentle humor, their agility and broad, agility and breadth of thought ease with which they shifted from one engineering field to another, and for that matter, from technology to social concerns and art. Then, too, they personified good manners and delicacy of taste, well-bred speech that flowed evenly and was free of uncultured words. One of them might play a musical instrument, another dabble in painting, and their faces always bore a spiritual imprint. From the beginning of the thirties I had lost contact with that milieu. Then came the war, and here before me stood an engineer, one of those who had replaced those destroyed. No one could deny him one point, of, one point of superiority. He was much stronger, more visceral, than those others had been. His shoulders and hands retained their strength, even though they had not needed it for a long time. Freed from the restraints of courtesy, he stared sternly and spoke impersonally, as if he didn't even consider the possibility of a dissenting view. He had grown up differently from those others, too, and he worked differently. His father had plowed the earth in the most literal sense, Lenya, blank, had been one of those dis disheveled, unenlightened peasant boys who wasted talent so distressed Belin whose wasted talent so distressed Belinsky and Tolstoy. He was certainly no Lomonosov, and he could never have gotten to the academy on his own, but he was talented. If there had been no revolution, he would have ploughed the land. He would have become well-to-do because he was energetic and active. He might have raised himself into a merchant, into the merchant class. It being the Soviet period, however, he entered the com Komsomol, and his work in the Komsomol, overshadowing his other talents, lifted him out of anon 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 anonymity, out of his lowly state, out of the countryside, and shot him like a rocket through the workers' school right into the industrial academy. He arrived there in 1929, at the very moment when those other engineers were being driven in whole herds into Gulag. It was urgently necessary for those in power to produce their own engineers, politically conscious, loyal, 100 percenters, who were to become big wigs of production, Soviet businessmen, in fact, rather than people who did things themselves. That was the moment when the famous commanding heights overlooking as the as yet uncreated industries were empty, and it was the fate of Blank's class and the Industrial Academy to occupy them. His life became a chain of triumphs, a garland winding right up to the peak, 
there were the exhausting years from 29 to 33, when the Civil War was being waged, not as in 18 and 20, 18 to 20 with tachonkas, machine guns mounted on horse-drawn carts, but with police dogs, when the long lines of those dying of famine trudged toward the railroad stations in the hope of getting to the cities, which was where the bread grains were evidently ripening, but refused tickets and were unable to leave, and lay dying beneath the station fences in a submissive human heap of homespun, homespun coats and bark shoes. In those same years, he not only did not know that bread was rationed to city dwellers, but at a time when a manual laborer was receiving 60 rubles a month in wages, he enjoyed a student scholarship of 900 rubles a month. His heart did not ache for the countryside whose dust he had shaken from his feet. His new life was already soaring elsewhere among the victors and the leaders. He never had time to be an ordinary run-of-the-mill foreman. He was immediately assigned to a position in which he had dozens of engineers and thousands of workers under him. He was the chief engineer of the big construction projects outside Moscow. From the very beginning of the war, he, of course, had an exemption for military service. He was evacuated to Alma-Ada together with the department he worked for, and in this area, he bossed even bigger construction prog projects on the Ili River. But in this case, his workers were prisoners. The sight of those little gray people bothered him very little at the time, nor did it inspire him to any re reappraisals, nor compel him to take a closer look. In that gleaming orbit in which he circled, the only important thing was to achieve the projected totals fulfillment of the plan and it was quite enough for him to merely him merely to punish a particular construction unit a particular camp and a particular work superintendent after that it was up to them to manage to fulfill their norm with their own resources how many hours had they how many hours they had to work to do it or what ration they had to get along on get along on were details that didn't concern him the war years deep in the rear of the best were the best years for him. Such is the eternal and universal aspect of war. The more grief it accumulates at one point of its poles, the more joy it generates at the other. He had not only he had not only a bulldog's jaw, but also a swift, enterprising, business-like grasp. With the greatest skill, he immediately switched to the economy's new wartime rhythm: everything for victory, give and take, and the war will write it all off. He made just one small concession to the war. He got along without suits and neckties, and camouflaging himself in khaki collar and chrome leather boots made to order and donned a general's tunic, the very one in which he appeared before us. That was fashionable and not uncommon at the time. It provoked neither anger in the war-wounded nor reproachful glances from women. Women usually looked at him with another sort of glance. They came to him to get well fed, to get warmed up, to have some fun. He had wild money passing through his hands, his billfold bulged like a little barrel with expense money, like a little barrel with expense money, and to him ten rouble notes were like kopecks and thousands like single roubles. He didn't hoard them, regret spending them, or keep count of them. He counted only the women who passed through his hands, and particularly those he had uncorked. This count was his sport. In the cell he assured us that his arrest had broken off the count at two ninety plus, and he regretted that he had not reached three hundred. Since it was wartime and the women were alone and lonely, and since, in addition to his power and money, he had a virility of a, of a Rasputin, one could probably believe him. He was quite prepared to describe one episode after another. It was just that our ears were not prepared to listen to him. Even though no danger threatened him during those last years, he had frantically grabbed these women, messed them up, and then thrown them away like a greedy diner eating boiled crayfish, grabbing one, devouring it, sucking it, then grabbing the next. He was so accustomed to this malleability of material to his own vigorous boar-like drive across the land. Whenever he was especially agitated, he would dash about the cell with a powerful boar who might just knock down an oak tree in his path. He was so accustomed to an environment in which all the leaders were his own kind of people, in which one could always make a deal, work things out, cover them up. He forgot that the more success one gains, the more envy one arouses. As he found out during his interrogation, a dossier had been accumulating against him since way back in 1936 on the basis of an anecdote he had carelessly told at a drunken party. More denunciations had followed and more testimony from agents. After all, one has to take women to restaurants where all types of people see you. Another report pointed out that he had been in no hurry to leave Moscow in 41 and that he had been waiting for the Germans. He had an actual fact stayed no longer, stayed on longer than he should have, apparently because of some woman. He took great care to keep his business deals clean, but he quite forgot the existence of Article 58. 
Nonetheless, the avalanche might not have overwhelmed him had he not grown overconfident and refused to supply building materials for a certain prosecutor's DACA. That was what caused his dormant case to awaken and tremble and start rolling. And this was one more instant of the fact that cases begin with the material self-interest of the Blue Boys. Have a good day, friends.